morning. Thank you for joining us today. Um, with me here is Mayor Brandon M. Scott, Deputy State's Attorney Tom Donnelly, Deputy Commissioner Brian Nato of our Public Integrity and Compliance Bureau, Deputy Commissioner Kevin Jones of our Criminal Investigation Bureau, Director Shannon Sullivan of our Consent Decree Compliance Unit, and Director Vernon Heron of our Officer Safety and Wellness. I'm Commissioner Richard Worley. Um, we're here today to announce something, one of the major milestones that the department has reached, something that we've been striving for for seven years. Um, it, it's not a crime accomplishment. It's something where we're going to show that we can both re reform a department and reduce crime at the same time. Together with the Department of Justice, we filed a joint motion that BPD has reached a state of full and effective compliance on two sections of our consent decree, transportation of persons in custody and officer assistance and support. The two sections represent 24 paragraphs of our decree. Reaching full and effective compliance in these two sections, especially the transportation of persons in custody, which led to Department of Justice's investigation of the department, is a significant step towards our progress. Even in the midst of challenges to include our staffing, the men and women of the BPD are committed to making continuous progress in our consent decree and striving to ensure that our views of our residents are represented in our reform efforts. As of December 2023, 25% of all paragraphs in the consent decree have been given a rating of being an initial compliance, and another 60% of all paragraphs of the decree are on track for initial compliance. Reaching full and effective compliance in these two sections of the consent decree represent a major shift in the culture of our department. Not only does it help us build trust and legitimacy with the community, but also sends a message to our members that health and wellness is a priority. Our reform initiatives are not only helping us win back our community, but they are also the roadmap to sustain reductions in gun violence. With the support of Mayor Scott and his administration, State's Attorney Bates and his administration, the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, and our ongoing collaborations with our many state, local, and federal partners, we had the largest single-year homicide reduction in the city. Still way too many. At, we technically had 242 last year. We had 21 that occurred the pre previous years to put the number at 263, but that is still way too many for a city of our size. One is too many. Um, so we want to continue to drive down violence while we reform the department. Our depart I believe our department is leading the way and showing that we can do both. You can reform a police department and reduce gun violence at the same time. This includes more lawful constitutional arrests, which was published in a recent arrest assessment by the monitoring decree team, less civilian complaints to the Public Integrity Bureau, and increased positive community feedback. As we strive towards reducing crime in our city and full compliance and transformation of our department, we will continue to improve retention, offer the best support and assistance to our officers, and address our, address our staffing challenges head on. Just last month, we announced the increase of our hiring initiative 10000 to $10,000 and we have recently promoted the uh, major from recruitment to lieutenant colonel, so we will have a new major there who will hit the ground running as well. With recent changes of our organizational structure, our department is working to boost hiring efforts, modernize our facilities and equipment, and working more effectively to improve retention, recruitment, and morale of our officers. I know firsthand there's still much more work to be done, but we remain steadfast in our commitment to fully comply with the necessary reforms of the consent decree and to provide our residents with the best police department that they want and most importantly deserve. Thank you for your time, and I will now turn it over to Mayor Brendan M. Scott. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, uh, Mr. Commissioner, and thank you all for being here. I want to start off by saying that this is not just a crucial, but a significant step in the right, right direction for BPD as we work towards full compliance with the consent decree. Uh, since I took office, the department has continued to make significant strides in the right direction. And as of uh, December of 23, 25 
percent of all paragraphs of the consent decree have been given a rating as being in initial compliance and another 60 as the commissioner mentioned of all paragraphs in the decree are on track for initial compliance when i release my administration's comprehensive violence reduction plan i made implementation of the consent decree mandated reforms a key part of our broader holistic approach and efforts to effectively address violence in our communities because i firmly believe and know that reform and accountability go hand in hand with law enforcement productivity. And let me be very clear, the only way that we're able to improve public safety is by doing it the right way. And we know uh, that we proved that it could be done that way last year. Constitutional community focused policing is the only effective policing model. Under my administration, I am proud that for the first time in the consent decree's nearly seven year history, we're able to join the DOJ in recommending the court to find us in full and effective compliance with sections of our consent decree. It is no coincidence that as we make progress in implementing the consent decree, we have also managed to achieve the record year reductions in violence in Baltimore City. In fact, uh, 2023 was the first year that Baltimore has had less than 300 homicides since the death of Freddie Gray in 2015. And as evidenced by today's joint filing with the DOJ, we are doing all this while making significant progress towards full compliance with the consent decree. Keep in mind uh, that transportation of persons in custody and offer us officer assistance and support are central aspects of the consent decree. And the failure to secure uh, and safely transport Freddie Gray is one of the main incidents that got BPD into a consent decree in the first place. This filing is evidence of the work they're doing to rectify those wrongs. Additionally, officer assistance and support is essential to officer retention, and it is needed to ensure that law enforcement personnel are in the proper mindset to perform at the highest levels. In fact, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention and recognize Director Hearn. Uh, when he joined BPD, he came to my office when I was a council person, and I said to him, we have to have a program around officer wellness in Baltimore City in order for us to be better. Our women and men see things that no one should see and no one checks on them. No one asks them if they're okay. No one talks about the impacts of what the job does to them each and every day. And now, even amidst shorting staffages seen in police departments across the country, Baltimore is a leader in this space, so thank you. Uh, director and everyone on the team for doing the work that you do, not only for BPD, because it's also oftentimes that I'm calling the director and said, hey, DPW just had someone die in the line of duty. Can you send your folks over to help and work with them? The fire department lost a firefighter. Can you send someone to work with them? Recreation and parks. So thank you for the great work that you do. Uh, and even amidst the staffing shortages seen in police departments all over the country, which I and the commissioner are committed to doing everything we can do to address here in Baltimore, BPD has managed to not just continue efforts to reform, but make it an absolute top priority. This is a testament of the commissioner's leadership, the work in, of the women and men in BPD each and every day, all the folks that are out here in front of us to make sure our communities are safer and see through the oversight and implementation of the consent decree. And I want to reiterate that this is an important step forward for the department, but we also recognize that there is much more work to be done in order to ensure full compliance with the consent decree and deliver the constitutional law enforcement that our communities need and deserve for us to continue to make Baltimore safer each and every day. Thank you. And with that, I will turn it over to our fabulous city solicitor, Ebony Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good morning. Today marks the first time in nearly seven years that the parties have been able to jointly petition to the court to find BPD and the city in compliance on two topics outlined in the consent decree. While BPD has made progress on all of the reforms called for in the consent decree, reaching a state of full and effective compliance is an important milestone for the department. 
Full and effective compliance is defined by the consent decree and requires BPD to, quote, demonstrate that they have incorporated all of the consent decree's requirements into policy, trained relevant personnel as necessary to fulfill their responsibilities pursuant to the material requirements, and ensured that each material requirement is being carried out in practice. And B, shown sustained and continuing improvement in constitutional police policing as demonstrated by the agreement's outcome assessments. Yesterday's joint filing demonstrates that not just BPD, but that the Department of Justice also feels that BPD has met those requirements. The two subjects in question have special significance to BPD. First is transportation. The significance of BPD's efforts to modernize this transportation is significant given the death of Freddie Gray, which occurred following injuries suffered while being transported by BPD. As determined by the monitoring team and now DOJ, BPD has transformed its policies and procedures related to transportation through modern equipment, training, and oversight so that today the department can meet the standards required for the safe transportation of persons in custody. Next is officer assistance and support. This section of the consent decree requires BPD to provide programs like counseling, peer support, and mental health services for BPD personnel. Under the mayor and the police commissioner, BPD has made significant progress in how it cares for its officers. As the monitoring team found, there is, and I quote, ample evidence of BPD undertaking initiatives and in creating programs for officers well beyond what the decree strictly requires. Supporting police officers through counseling and mental health services not only aids in recruitment and retention, but also promotes overall workforce resilience. The parties are seeking a determination from the court, agreeing with the monitoring team, that the parties reach the state of full and effective compliance on these two subjects. Once that occurs, BPD and the city will need to demonstrate one year of sustained compliance. The parties must also continue to strive towards compliance on the other sections of the consent decree. But again, today is a historic milestone for the department. The fact that this milestone is occurring at a time when the city is achieving a recent and historic reduction in violent crime, as the mayor stated, is a testament to the effectiveness of, con of constitutional and community-focused policing. As crime rates decline, our communities experience enhanced safety and well-being. This positive outcome strengthens the bond between law enforcement and the public, creating a positive feedback loop that propels us toward a safer and more resilient city. In essence, constitutional policing and the reduction of crime are inseparable components of our law enforcement strategy. They are not disparate goals, Rather, they are interconnected elements that reinforce each other. Today, we affirm our commitment to constitutional principles as the driving force behind our crime reduction initiatives. Together, we build a safer community where justice, fairness, and respect for individual rights guide our path forward. Thank you. At this time, I will turn it over to Director Vernon Heron of BPD's Officer Safety and Wellness. Thank you, Solicitor Thompson, Mayor Scott, Commissioner Worley, for having me here today. If it wasn't for their investment in the, uh, the men and women who serve this department, we would not be here. I am Director Heron, and I oversee the Baltimore Police Department's Officer Safety and Wellness Section. Since joining the department in 2016, the Officer Safety and Wellness Section has been the cornerstone of our mission at the Baltimore Police Department providing the best assistance and support to officers, helps us improve our performance, boost morale, and develop a more resilient police department. I am proud to work closely with our Consent Decree Implementation Unit in this work and celebrate our progress on full and effective compliance. Our health and wellness team works passionately and diligently creating innovative ways to keep members engaged and provide necessary support to members. This includes line of duty death of a departmental member, 
serious injury of a departmental member, police involved shootings, and assisting members with daily mental health needs as they face the stresses of police work. We have trained more than 75 police officers, professional staff to become peer support members. They're supporting our department on a daily basis. Our members are the department's most valuable resources, so it is of the utmost importance that we provide the necessary support and resources for them to succeed <clears throat> in serving our community. Just last year, we embarked upon building a new early intervention system to monitor and track indicators that could pose potential risk to the members, the, the department, and public. This system, coupled with ethical policing and courageous training, represents a culture change in the Baltimore City Police Department and our commitment to support our members and the neighborhoods we serve. I am very proud to work. I am very proud of the work that we've done here in Baltimore. As we continue to lead other law enforcement agencies in this work of officer support and assistance. Officer Safety and Wellness and our Employee Assistance Program is accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We are here for our members and we continue to offer necessary assistance and support to each member and we, as, we continue, as they continue their careers in the police department. In conclusion, I would like to say, we've had more than 50 police departments reach out to the Baltimore City Police Department about our Officer Safety and Wellness and our Peer Support Program. Just the other day, I had a Zoom meeting with a police department from Surrey Police Department. And when I asked the inspector, what state are you from? She says, I'm not from the United States, I'm from the UK. And I said, how did you hear about Baltimore City Police Department's Office of Safety and Wellness Program? She says, well, we are building or rebuilding our police department and we have discovered a book called The Copper's Lot. And in this book, it highlights the work in Baltimore City Police, and it also has copies of our policy. Today, I am proud to be part of this magnificent team. Sitting before you are several of our members who work in the peer support program. They are not only sworn members, they are civilian staff, professional staff, they work in forensics, IT, PIB, uh, dispatchers, call takers, and even retirees who come out of retirement to continue to support our department. Today is a great day in Baltimore. It's a great day for the Baltimore City Police Department, and I am proud to serve, and thank you, Commissioner Worley and uh, Mayor Scott for allowing me to be here. We will now take a few questions. I'll turn it over to Lindsay. We'll have everyone line up over here. We'll take on-topic questions first. Two questions per outlet. Okay. Hey, Commissioner. Ken Duffy with BL Radio. Um, you mentioned um, that there's 25% initial compliance as of December of last year, but this consent decree has been going on for seven years. Uh, as far as full compliance, at the last hearing as well, the judge uh, mentioned that he was getting impatient in, his, in so many words with compliance. So when will you become fully compliant with the consent decree? Will it take several more years? I mean, do you have any kind of timeline on that? Well, th this is the first step and my goal when I took office was for it to be completely satisfied within the three years of, of my contract. My contract is three years. So I, my goal is to do it in under three if we can, but we have to, when we do it, we have to do it right. You can't rush it. And for the first probably three to four years with the consent decree, we really weren't fully engaged in it. It's just over the last four or five years that we've become fully engaged and we've started moving forward. Um, and as you see, there's, some, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, but 85% is either initial or on its path. Um, so we have to continue to push that forward. And then the 15% that we haven't done so well on or haven't started, we have to do that. But hopefully within the next two years, two and a half years, I'd like to be completely satisfied with the consent decree. But that, that's not the end of it because just because the consent decree is no longer overseeing our department, the changes are forever. 
the way the department does everything has changed and will continue to change because we're a much better police department from it. And just a quick follow-up um, on the flip side. Do you think the judge has been fair in this process uh, over the course of these seven years, uh, Judge Berdar in particular, in, in, in assessing what is happening with BPD? And you mentioned the progress as well last year with homicides dropping. And even this year, there's an almost 60 percent drop so far in the month of January. you think he's been fair in his assessment of, of your progress uh, complying with this? Yes, I think he's been, I, I think we couldn't have asked for a better judge monitoring team or DOJ team. I think it, it is a team. It's not working. He's, he's tough. He's not going to be easy, but I'd, I'd like it like that. I want, him, I want him to be tough and tell us what we need to improve and tell us when we're not doing well. But no, I think we couldn't have done better. Um, I think Judge Bradar is, is excellent and will continue to push this, and he's even staying on to make sure he sees it through its end. Emily Hofstetter at WYPR. Um, Worley, you said that we have 25% um, in initial compliance, 60% on the way towards that. Is it possible to say kind of overall how close we are to full compliance? Is that like a number that's able to be get? Not really. That The 24 paragraphs, and I'll let um, someone else jump in. The two areas we're hitting today are 24 paragraphs, roughly of 470. So it's about 5%, but you have to start walking before you can start running, so. Thank you. Hi. Okay. What? Hi, I'm Alexa Ashwell, Fox 45. Um, during the consent decree hearings, it's been said that the staffing shortage is the largest barrier to achieving full compliance. Where does the department stand today and what is your plan to get more boots on the ground in the immediate? The, the department, we're still about 500 short, probably before the next few months, we're going to be under 2,000 police officers. Um, we were right around 2013 and we have some retirements, but we're working to do many things. One of the initiatives that I put forth when I started was we had 300 officers leave over the last three years. We went through and looked at every one of those cases to see how many of those officers we wanted to have back because they are still um, basically MPTC certified. So they could come back with an expedited uh, academy and be back on the street in a short period of time. We've written a letter to all the ones that we wanted to bring back. Obviously, some we don't want to come back because they left in for not so good terms. So and we're offering them the same incentive that we're offering the new hires. But we're also, the, the thing that we, I think we missed in the past is we never concentrated as much on keeping the people that are here. Um, so that's what we're doing now. We don't want people to leave. We want them to be our best advertisement to come here. So we have to treat the people that are here, already here doing the work, that have been responsible for the accomplishments we made. We've got to treat them well so that they stay and just keep advertising that this is a good place to come. So we're doing everything we can. The $10,000 incentive um, recruitment is going to be bolstered up. So a lot of things we're moving forward to try to get more police officers here. How does it dictate your crime fighting strategy? It doesn't really. We're not, even if I hired 500 today, they're not getting on the street so, for, a, for a year. So our strategy is to do more with less, just like we did in 2023. Um, and one thing I know is if you give our officers a goal and you tell them why we're doing it, they'll, they can accomplish anything as we did in 2023. Hi, Elizabeth from WMAR. Um, I also had a question about staffing, but specifically I wanted to see if you could respond to the consent monitoring team's review. I think it was in August. Um, they talked about how staffing has been posing a problem with community policing. They just don't have enough time to walk the beat, engage with people in the community, and it's really becoming an issue. I just wanted to see if you could just talk about the struggles with community policing in specific. Yeah, yeah obviously that's the one part of the, the consent decree that we, we struggled with. But we've made some changes. We've, we've um, redone our community policing model. We've changed a couple different things. We have a, a new deputy commissioner of um, patrol and community policing. And the area that obviously that we failed the most was Brooklyn. Well, the 
the deputy commissioner used to be the major in the Southern District, which oversees Brooklyn. And she, along with her team, is rebolstering the community policing plan because we, we didn't do well because we didn't put, a, we didn't put as, as much emphasis in it as we should have. So we have to correct that and move forward. Um, and we, we're starting a lot of different things under the Criminal Investigation Bureau to relieve our district commanders or some of the burdens that kept them from the time of being able to work with community policing with the officers. So we have a new area in, in the Criminal Investigation Bureau that's going to handle the, the detective unit so the deputy commissioner, I mean the majors can spend more time with their officers and supervisors out there doing community policing. So the whole goal of 2023, and I hit the roll calls and I explained to the officers why we're doing foot why we need them to do those 10 to 15 minutes, three times a shift. And I think once we get that message out, they'll do it. They'll do whatever we ask them to do if we tell them why. And, and they saw the, the results last year. One of the other recent reports, I think this one was from October, was talking about um, just they were getting anecdotes and questions from the public, just a community survey overall. Um, and a lot of people just had a lot of negative perceptions and the public trust was really low. So how do you kind of bridge the gap between perceptions and data, like we're talking about 25%, 60% compliance, those numbers don't really mean much to people if they're just not having positive interactions with the police. So how do you kind of bridge that gap? Well, the first thing you have to do is look at the look at who was asked those questions and what areas the questions were asked. Every, you can get almost any kind of results for any survey if you, if you place it in the right, make all the, the uh, guidelines to get what you want. But the way I look at it is, we are getting more help from the community on cases. As I go out in the community a lot, um, I start to see people thanking us for our officers. So I think as long as we are gaining the community's trust, and I think we're doing that, we could have never gone under 300 homicides if the community didn't trust us enough to give us tips um, as far as carjackings and everything as well. And you're starting to see I think a shift to they, they're supporting the police department more um, and perception takes a while to change. It's we we uh, we unfortunately we kind of earned the reputation we had over several years and it's going to take us several years to change it. But we're on that path to change it and get, win the community back. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just going to add into to both of your questions really quickly and just say uh, we also know uh, when you talk about the burden on our police officers, this is why we start to implement our smart policing program, right? We can't say that we want our police officers to, our patrol officers specifically, to have better relationships and spend time working with the community if we have them responding to things that, quite frankly, police shouldn't be responding to, uh, which is why uh, we started smart policing. And in fact, a part of that is our NAMA one diversion program for which uh, the city of Baltimore and the police department got an award from the Maryland Association of Counties around innovation. This is why we're asking folks when you have small minor things uh, that can be done over the phone or online that allows the officers to actually investigate those things and build those relationships to file those reports that way. We can't say that everything is an emergency and at the same time, want them to actually build relationships, which is why we have to alleviate some of that burden from the women and men who are making answering those calls to allow them to focus on uh, the, the most important things, the violent things, the people that are stealing cars, et cetera, but also have that time to build uh, relationships in the community. And to your other point, I think, yes, we know, right, as the commissioner said, with the, with, what the data said and what the reports say, but we also know that we are getting more calls, more tips, and we are getting less complaints in about behaviors of our, about the women and men in the police department, which shows that we're moving in the right direction and we're not going to stop until we, we continuously build the best department that we can be. Hey, I'm Darcy from the Baltimore Sun. Uh, Commissioner Worley, I know you talked about community policing specifically, <clears throat> but can you or maybe the consent decree implementation unit run through some of the other big ticket items that the police department still needs to work toward in order to reach full compliance? Sure. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, Director Shannon Sullivan with the Consent Decree Implementation Unit at BPD. Uh, so, right, not with the Department of Justice, not with the monitoring team, the BPD employee. Uh, we have many areas that we're currently working on and the monitors are currently assessing us. So you, you saw that there was an arrest assessment that recently came out 
We're also expecting an assessment on behavioral health pretty soon, another assessment on use of force, a very large assessment. I mean, they're all very large. They're very comprehensive, but one particularly on uh, the Public Integrity Bureau, PIB, and misconduct investigations, because that is the largest section, has the most paragraphs of the decree. So we are, we are, you're going to start seeing sort of like a snowball effect. All of these assessments are going to start coming out within the next six months or so. So those percentages that we talk about, you know, the 60%, the 20%, all of that's going to change pretty soon uh, because we're going to get more detailed information and feedback from them, as well as any places where we might need to make additional improvements. And then in terms of the 15% that's not um, like on track or in initial compliance, can you walk through what those are and where the hurdles are? So there's a couple of paragraphs that haven't been assessed yet that are related to performance evaluations, for example, and some of that was just we needed to get the performance evaluation system implemented, and that's now through Workday, which the city didn't have before. So th that's an example of some areas. There's some areas where there's still some training going on so that we can't assess implementation until after the training has been complete, and part of that was also related to performance evaluations. So we have to make sure people know how to properly conduct this. Barry Sims, WBAL-TV. Commissioner and Mayor also just wondering about frustrations, things that you're looking at as you try to get done with uh, uh, and be in total compliance. What types of things are really frustrating you besides the uh, uh, not being able to get um, enough officers, trying to hire officers? What are the bigger things that are really frustrating you right now with us? I think the, the Barry, uh, thank you for the question. I think that uh, the biggest thing uh, the commissioner hinted, hinted at earlier, uh, we should have been a lot further along in the consent decree than we are. But for whatever reason, uh, the folks that came before us uh, did not, before me, not before the commissioner or the previous commissioner before me, did not see it uh, for the value that it can have for the city of Baltimore and the police department. But now that everyone and who's at the top matters, right? If the person at the top isn't truly invested in something, we know that it'll fall by the wayside. So my biggest frustration isn't with what's happening. I know these folks are working hard each and every day to bring us into full compliance. My frustration is what happened before, uh, because when you add on uh, that lackadaisical attitude towards the consent decree in the beginning, and then you add on to that that we had a, a global pandemic that pushed everything back, right? We should be a lot further along, and were it not for those things, I know that we would be. But today is a significant step, and we're, a step, and we're going to acknowledge that, but we have to continue to push, to push forward. We know I, when I leave here today, I'm headed to Washington, D.C. for the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and I know we're going to have a discussion, and I know that mayors around the country are going to be complaining and that they don't have police academy classes at all. So in one sense, I should feel blessed that I am still having academy classes and that the commission and I are still greeting and graduating people. But at the same time, I know that it's still not at the pace that we want it, but we understand that we have to evolve and change as the nature of law enforcement, not just here in Baltimore, but the country has done so. And, and I, I honestly don't get frustrated for a really long period of time. It's a waste of energy. If I get frustrated, I just move on because I've been here for 26 years and I've seen how far we've come. And I've seen where we, I know where we are now compared to even where we were two years ago, three years ago. So we're moving in the right direction and we just have to continue to do it um, at the same pace that we're doing it and make sure we get it right, don't rush into anything. Um, and we can, we're doing both at the same time, reform and reducing violence at the same time, which I don't think has been done in the country. So I'm proud of the men and women, so I don't get frustrated. And I think I'll just add something else very, very quickly to that point, uh, that, that that is my other frustration, uh, that you have folks who in some cases are purposely uh, trying to make this an either or, that you have to either reform the department or reduce violence in the city. And we've proven that you can do both, right? And I think that as long as we're continuing to push that and have that information be shared so that folks know that they don't have to make this false choice of wanting to be safe or, and wanting not to be harassed every day just because they live in a certain neighborhood, right? We know that we can do this the right way as we've proven uh, last year and we're gonna continue to do that. Hello, um, my name is Penelope Blackwell with the Baltimore Banner. Um, I'm curious where the department stands on producing stop and search data. 
I know their agency has had some delays with um, the system, the content management system that's used for um, logging this data. So. Uh, so I'll just remind everyone too, we have a conversation with the court on Thursday, next Thursday. It's our public quarterly hearing. Uh, and in that we will talk more extensively about the transport assessment, about officer safety and wellness, but we will also have a component where we'll talk about the arrest assessment and where we are in terms of collecting data on stops and searches. I know that's been a frustration for some, uh, for us too. We want to be able to move up faster on that. There were a lot of things that needed to be in place to get that, the, to get it right. Again, the data, getting it right is really important, not just quickly. Uh, and so we'll be able to provide some additional details on that as well. And we can also talk um, offline about it. But we, there's, it's, very, it's, it's a pretty complex issue, uh, but we are working on it actively. And we are very close to getting exactly what the monitoring team and Department of Justice need. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Paul Gessler with WJZ. Um, with as you all know, there have been calls from some to just pull out of the consent decree or make efforts to get out of the consent decree. Perhaps many of you have had those internal thoughts or external thoughts uh, in the past few years. To Do today's accomplishments reaffirm that you're in it for the long haul, or can you do some of these things without federal oversight? So I'll just be very blunt, Paul. Uh, as I just said before to the previous question, this isn't a false choice, right? Uh, we are in this for the long haul because this is the right thing to do. Uh, when we uh, entered into this consent decree and you think about where we were in 2015, uh, you wouldn't have anybody from Prince George's County, let alone the UK, asking, hey, how did the Baltimore Police Department do anything? But now we hear from departments across this country and the world about how we are making this department better. But I think the important thing about that is that we're doing that and reducing violence at the same time uh, so that we know that these women and men are out there busting their butts each and every day. Uh, they took over 2,900 illegal guns off the streets just last year alone and already have, have taken some off of this year. We're going to continue to do that work. And those folks who are uh, peer pushing and parroting this that you have to get out of the consent decree. We all going to we want to get out of the consent decree, but we're going to do it the right way. And you can't just pull out of a consent decree. So uh, folks who are saying you should just pull out of it, they don't know how consent decrees work. Uh, you don't get to tell the federal government what to do. The federal government tells you what to do. Uh, so that shows that the folks that are saying that don't even have the basic intellect to be even in a conversation about whether we should be in it or not. But if they grew up where I grew up, and live through what I lived through as a young man uh, growing up in Baltimore to see where we are as a department now, while we're not perfect, they would acknowledge that progress alongside the progress of reducing violence because this is not a choice of whether we can have our police officers doing their work each and every day or having our police officers do that work constitutionally. We can do both. We can reduce uh, homicides and violence in the city of Baltimore and uh, go towards full implementation of the, consent, of the consent decree at the same time. And a quick follow-up for you and others who have been here um, for a while. It's been coming up on nine years since Freddie Gray's death. 17 years in City Hall for me. Um, if, if you'd been told nine years ago that it would have taken this amount of time to, to make these improvements with uh, with transportation and transporting people in police custody? What would you have thought? I mean, it's, it's quite a long time to make these improvements. Well, there may be tape of me saying that there's no way we're gonna do this in five years, right? We knew that. If you look and monitor how consent decrees have worked with departments around the country, nobody did it in two, three, four, five years. We're talking about uh, systems and things that had been ignored and not put in place for decades. So to think that we're going to solve all of those that quickly, uh, especially, as I said earlier, without the leadership fully investing and believing in them for the first three years, right? That was a, that was a bad thought. Now we know that we have to do it. And this is not about doing things quickly, right? We have to do it the right way and make sure that we're putting these things into policy and practice so that they're not undone once all of us are gone. We have to make sure that we are uh, uh, finishing the job and doing it with every single detail, every T cross, every I dotted in a period or exclamation point at the end of every sentence. So I said back then we knew it was gonna take longer than five years. Now, of course, none of us knew that this thing called COVID would show up, right? But 
we're going to continue the work because we know it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Oh. Last, question. Last question. Carl Ferran with the Baltimore Sun. I was just curious if anyone in Baltimore City uh, has reached out to the family of Freddie Gray throughout this ordeal, uh, especially lately, and, um, and have you heard anything from them regarding how you guys are doing as far as since? No, we have not. Thank you, everyone. Can I have all of our peer support members um, at the front? We're going to take a photo.